This spherical urn has a couple of components. There's the sphere itself, which is hollow, but the hollowing doesn't have to be perfect if you run your finger inside of here. There's bumps and ridges, and that's okay because this will be sealed up, and nobody's ever going to know what the inside of this looks like when it's on display. Then there's a cap, which seals up that opening. The end user would glue this in place with the ashes inside. And then to give it a little more lift off of uh, the display shelf, the base, which is a square block, has just a real shallow hole drilled in it. And that cap fits into that. This also gives a nice plaque area. You could attach like a brass nameplate, something like that if you wanted to on here. Then all three pieces go together as a display memorial for your beloved pet. Something as simple as this hollow pet urn could be made to any shape that you desire. But a sphere has its own intriguing qualities because the curve is, is so perfect. But trying to create that curve can, can be a little problematic. You can certainly use um, jigs that you can purchase or make. And you can also use templates, but those are typically good for, for one size sphere. The technique that I like to use is using a ring. And so by placing a ring on a surface that's perfectly spherical, if it has the exact same curvature in one axis, it will have the same curvature in the other axis. Therefore, it's perfectly spherical for that diameter ring. If you slide the ring around, it should maintain contact all the way around the ring. This gives you a gauge to go by to, to determine if something is a perfect sphere. The diameter of this ring isn't critical. The smaller the ring is, the less area you have to work with on guessing. I have to initially make this ring fit over the span of this ring. By making a smaller ring, I have less guesswork. Unfortunately, the smaller the ring is, the more difficult it is to perceive small variations when it becomes unspherical. So I usually start with a smaller ring, about an inch or so in diameter, maybe a little larger. And then as soon as I can, when I've turned enough of the sphere, I switch to a larger diameter ring. This one's uh, two and a half or so inches in diameter. And that allows me to see my flaws much easier and, and work with those. The rings themselves, you could honestly use any ring that you wanted to. You can, you can buy washers. Uh, you can probably find pretty much anything that's round, laying around, that's stiff. Um, I actually make my own rings, and I make them for a couple of reasons. I want to guarantee that it's perfectly round, that it's not stamped and, and slightly oval. Um, I want to guarantee that it has a shape that's useful. And so by having a very crisp corner on the ring where the inside meets the outside, it allows me to see variations much easier than if it were a straight-sided cylinder. And I can shape the outside so that if I'm working up against another detail, I can use the ring pretty close to another detail. I choose to turn them out of Corian because it doesn't tend to break. If you make this out of wood, they usually work, but because it's so thin, seasonal changes in wood movement will cause that ring to just break apart. It'll literally lay in pieces on your bench later when you, when you go to pick it up. Um, so the Corian holds up well to that, um, and also it holds a, a good crisp edge there that I can easily see. So I'll start with a scrap here for the glue block. Just mount this in the chuck. Just turn the end of it round, put a tenon on it. Then 
then I'll put the tenon in the chuck. It's just a little more secure grip and I don't have the corners flopping around while I'm using it. Not really important, but. And I'll reduce this diameter slightly. Nothing critical. It was about two inches. That's closer to inch and a quarter or so. The end of it's fairly flat from the saw, but I want to make sure that it's dead flat and perpendicular. So I'll use the skew, just cutting across the end grain. Make a nice clean cut, nice and smooth. And when I stop the lathe, I'll double check that it is flat with the side of a, a tool. Now I'm going to glue the Corian. Corian's typically only a half an inch thick, so it's not really enough material to chuck onto. So I'm just going to put a little bit of glue. I've got a center point here when I band sawed it out. I'm going to use that to help line it up with the tail stock. I'll just put some super glue on here. I usually kind of rub a little bit on there, let it soak into that ingrain a little bit, and then put a little bit more. And I'll use the center point of the tail stock. Just to clamp that up nice and straight. And a little bit of accelerator. Make sure that cures and sometimes if I feel like it, I'll run in a little bead of super glue right around the outside. Sometimes it makes me feel that it holds better. And even with the activator, I usually give it a minute or so to make sure it's fully cured. So turning Corian really works well with a parting tool. It's very abrasive, so you'll need to sharpen your tool frequently. Parting tool is really quick and simple to sharpen, but you just want to take light little scraping cuts. You can work in any direction you like. The smaller the cut is, the better it works. And with the outside round and smooth, I can start shaping the ring a little bit. You can see I can work in different directions. I can work left and right. I can also plunge. is just light cuts. And a little shaping on this side.
to plunge in and shape the inside of the ring. I can continue using a parting tool, but because I'm plunging, I very quickly begin cutting with the full width of the tool. And because it works best taking small bites, I'll switch to a narrower parting tool. Once I plunge a little bit, then I'll widen the groove. The key is that I want a very crisp edge right at this point. And by tapering it slightly wider in diameter as I go deeper, using the ring, it makes it a little easier to see. As you get close to the back side, you will notice it becomes a little more translucent. Typically, there'll be some breakout on this back side, and that's the reason that I shape it from that side. This is the edge that's important. This edge here, if the breakout bothers you, you can use a knife. And just clean that up or Dremel tool. With the piece that's left, there's enough to make the smaller ring, or you can make it out of other scraps as well. So to make this urn, I'm going to start with a piece of walnut. This is about six inches in diameter. I just band sawed it round and about eight inches long. It gives me enough length to make the base and everything. I'm going to start with a spindle roughing gouge and make this round and cylindrical. So that is round. Now I'm going to measure the diameter. It's just under six inches. I'd actually like it to be slightly smaller, close to five and a half. It doesn't have to be exact. I'm going to choose to take a little more off. right on five and a half. So that, that's simple, easy math, two and three quarters. Just split that in half. So first I'm gonna mark the end about a half an inch. I'm just gonna eyeball about a half an inch from the left end. So now I'll mark the radius, which in this case is about two and three quarters. That'll be the center line or equator of the sphere. 
mark the other end. And just to double check, I always like to measure then from one end to the other. And it is five and a half. So I have the center and the two ends of the sphere defined. This right end is waste material and material for the base. I'll use a parting tool to part down on the right line to the right of the line. And I'll take that material down to about three inches in diameter. Widen the part slightly. Just minimizes the friction as I'm parting deep. That's just about three inches. I can reduce the rest of this. Roughing gouge makes quick work. The diameter is not critical, just close. Now I'm going to continue parting this down. I'll make this just a little under two inches. It's right about two, so just a tiny bit more off. Eventually, to make the base, I want to put a tenon on this end that I can grab with my chuck. A lot of times with green wood like this, you may get a little fuzzing. So you can use the bevel of a spindle detail gouge. You can cut that face nice and clean. Then you can flip the gouge over and cut the opposite direction. Clean up the side of the tenon. That'll give a good surface to grab with the chuck there. Now I'm going to go back to my wider parting tool, actually a bedan, but I use it as a parting tool. I'm going to part 
on the left side of the left line. This is establishing the end of the sphere on this end. I'm going to take this down to about three inches as well. Then I'm going to leave that line. I'm going to create just a tenon. So that's about a half an inch long. That's too long. For chuck jaws, I need something a little bit shorter. So I'll bring the end of it down to a smaller tenon. It's not quite as long. And to hollow this, I'll be using a little bit larger chuck jaws than I typically use. They're three inch jaws. They will provide more stability for the hollowing process. And I do have a little bit of fuzz that I'll clean up with the spindle gouge on the shoulder of this tenon. Now I'm going to roughly shape the sphere. I'm going to use the spindle roughing gouge because I can make quick work. of just kind of removing the corners. Being careful not to hit the waist with the wing. Same thing on the left side. I am being careful to leave that parting cut that I initially made. That's the transfer of the left pencil line and the end of the sphere. So I have not removed that. I will keep that as a reference. Now the sphere has a general spherical shape, albeit elongated. It's, you can always take an elongated sphere and remove off the ends and make it perfect. Once it's a squashed sphere and it's shorter than it is in diameter, it's very difficult to make that sphere spherical again because you have to remove the diameter at that point. To gauge this sphere and make sure that it's perfect, I'm going to use the ring. I'm going to start by placing the smaller, about one inch diameter ring on the equator, the center of the sphere. At that point, You'll notice that there's a gap underneath the middle of the ring, and yet it's touching on the two sides. What that tells me is that I need to remove wood where the ring is touching. That means from the right and from the left side. Now at this point, it's a guess as to how much wood to remove and what shape to remove. So it's the reason that I'm starting with a smaller ring because I'm only having to guess one inch of shape. Now I like to do the majority of my shaping with a bowl gouge, a square ground bowl gouge in fact, 
And as I use it, I'll actually start inverting the flute. But I use the side of the wing, and I use it a lot like a skew chisel. I will lay it on the back of the bevel. I'll raise the handle just until it begins to cut. And then I will push the tool forward, rolling and lifting to create a curve. Now I won't turn real far because I'm only trying to fit the ring in the center. So I'm going to work a little bit on the right and a little bit on the left. And for the moment, I don't care about the extra material. I'll place the ring back on there. I still see a gap in the center, still touching on the sides. That tells me I need to remove wood from the sides. I'll start cutting just to the side of the pencil line. beginning with hardly any material removal. And you can see the cut gets a little more aggressive as I go around the sphere. Again, I'll just stop there, come back to the left side, do the same thing. And once I'm comfortable with the tool cutting, I will look to the top side of the sphere to gauge its shape. Now there's still a gap in the center, but the gap is getting smaller, which means I'm getting closer. So I'm going to continue making these cuts until the ring fits perfectly from one side to the other. Which will be roughly between those pencil lines. As I'm turning, I tend to just store the ring on the handle of the tool. Keeps me from losing it while I'm working. Because I'm guessing, I want to make small controlled cuts. I don't want to remove a lot of material. There's still a small gap, very small, but still a small gap, very close. So now the ring fits perfectly. There is no gap. It's touching all the way around. So I know it's perfectly spherical in that spot. If I slide the ring to the right, a gap develops. The trick is to determine where that gap starts. right there, and at the point where the right hand side of the ring makes contact with the wood, the 
right at that pencil line, it is no longer spherical. The same thing on the left. The larger ring, as you can see, would be very difficult to use at this point because I would still be guessing at this ring fitting. As soon as I can make this ring fit, I will use the larger ring because it'll be easier to see that gap develop. So to make it a little easier to see, I have marked with a pencil where I need to start removing wood. So I will mark that with the lathe running. And given its current shape, that's pretty easy to see. But if I remove a lot of that waste, Now it's less obvious without the pencil line where I need to start cutting. So the pencil line tells me that's where I need to begin my cut. I will lay the bevel against the wood just behind the pencil line, raise the handle until it starts rubbing. And the key is to begin cutting exactly at the pencil line. Remove the pencil line and try to continue that same curve. If in doubt, continue straight, and you can see it becomes elongated. Stop and repeat the process with the ring. Place the ring at the center, slide it to the right, until a gap develops. Make a note of that point or mark it with a pencil. And that's where my next cut begins. Lay it on the back of the bevel just behind the pencil line. Raise the handle up till it's rubbing just before the pencil line. Cutting at the pencil line and gradually removing a little bit more wood as we go around. If I'm unsure, stop rolling the tool, push straight forward, cuts a taper. That ensures that it's elongated. If I roll the tool further, I may squash the sphere. Now the ring fits much further. I've transferred the line down right there. I'll make a note of that. So now between these two pencil lines, it's perfectly spherical. And I could tell that from the small ring. But because the ring is small, it's difficult to see in there as well. My larger ring almost fits between those lines. So probably after one more cut, I can start using my larger ring. But if I try to use it now, I'm not quite sure if I need to remove wood on the left or the right or both because there is a gap because it's not spherical inside the diameter of the ring. right on the lines. So I can just fit the larger ring. So now I will only use the larger ring because I can see in there easier. 
And as soon as I cross that line, it starts to open up a gap. I can easily see behind here. So I begin my cut there, work to the right. And that's good. That's real close to the stock that I've left there. That's going to be turned away later anyway, so that is, that is far enough. Now I'll use the same ring to continue working the left side. I do still want to keep this line. This is the end of the sphere, the very end, the left-hand line. So I want to keep that reference point. But I, I can take this material down to about the diameter of the chuck. I, I don't want to take it smaller than that because I want enough stability that when I hollow it, the wood doesn't flex. So this is a spot where the bowl gouge no longer fits in here very well. The wings get in the way. So at this point, I'll, I'll typically switch to the spindle detail gouge. Again, leaving that parting cut line. I'll basically cut a V from each side, one side being the sphere and the other side being waste. But the shape of the spindle detail gouge, I'm able to get down up against that waste. Now that I got the sphere shaped, I'll mount this tenon in the chuck, part off this waste here that's going to become the base later on, and hollow it out. And when you get it pretty close, you can stop and saw that off by hand. Or just catch it. With the waste removed off the end, I want to drill a hole to begin hollowing. So I'll just use the parting tool just to start a center point here. Make it a little easier for the drill bit to get started. So I've mounted a drill bit in the tailstock with a Jacobs chuck, just about a half inch. I'll slow it down a little bit as I drill. Drilling this hole to begin hollowing and to give me a depth stop. With a short travel on the quill, just make small cuts, retract the quill, and then advance the tailstock. And I've made a note on the depth of the drill so I know how deep to drill. Should be about good. I'll just eyeball the depth here to be sure, but that gives me a, about a half inch, half to three quarters of an inch at the top there to hollow. That'll be great. I'll do the majority of my hollowing with a straight tool like this, and then a bent tool like this. And I've outfitted each into an arm brace handle, but you can put a tool into any handle that's comfortable for you. 
I'll start inside the hole I've created. Then I'll pull the tool to the left, widening the hole. And I'll go out just to the lip where I, where I stopped um, turning the sphere. I'll just make small cuts from the center out. When I get to the edge, I'll stop. I'll go back to the inside. I'll feel that corner. Make a shallow cut. I get a lot of vibration. I'll stop, take a lighter cut. Come back, I can feel that corner. Pull out, go back, I can feel that corner. Initially, it's just really opening and closing my left hand as I open my left hand tool travels back towards the center. As I close it, I'm cutting from the center out. And I'll just go ahead and create this size hole about a third of the depth. I try to always cut from the center out. And then if I need to, out towards the tailstock end. If I'm going towards the headstock, I'm trying to just feel. I'm trying not to actually cut. And the same thing going back towards center. I may drag the tool across to feel where I can't see. But I try not to cut until I'm pulling away from center. Put the tool in, I can feel the shelf I stop, pull it out, and I can see I've gone about an inch and a half deep. So now I'll begin the next cavity, which is going to open up into the sphere, and I'll, I'll continue with the straight tool. Again, working from the center outward. I can either use my fingers and pull as I was before, or I can use my right arm to swing. Always trying to cut going outwards, just feeling going back in. So now the second cavity that I've hollowed, it's about half the depth of the first, comes out a lot further. I can use my fingers and, and feel, get an idea as to, to what that's like, but I can use a pair of calipers. These vessel calipers work pretty well for most of it here. Um, I can just get them inside the opening. The key is that I want this leg to be 90 degrees to the face of the sphere at all times. And I can see that there's a, there's a little gap there that's probably just over an eighth of an inch. And as I 
push the calipers in and swing them slightly, trying to keep this leg 90 degrees to the surface. That gap closes and, and stops right there. That's as deep as I have hollowed. And that's how much thicker it is here than it is here. So that gives me an idea. I need to remove just a little more material in this range. I'll switch over to the bent tool to reach that. The key to the bent tool is that the straight part of the tool has to be on the tool rest. So I do have to have the tool rest back further than I typically would. But remember, inside the hollow form, a straight tool is unsupported as well. So that's the reason that hollowing tools are pretty beefy. They need to be able to extend out over the tool rest a good ways. But this bent tool will allow me just barely to be able to sneak in, cut underneath, down to where I've, I've stopped cutting. I can feel my shelf there where I've stopped hollowing that cavity. So I'll just clean this up. Still want to work in the same manner. I want to be pulling out from center and from headstock to tailstock. And then when I move in the opposite directions, I'm trying to just feel. I'm trying not to cut at those times. This is where the arm brace really excels. Allows the for, my forearm to support the tool as it's overhanging. It gives a lot of control. Now I've hit, hit the ledge there. So I'll stop the lathe. Pull the tool out. So if I go back in and check with the calipers here, I go down to my, my shelf there, try to get the leg intersecting the sphere at a 90 degree angle. I can adjust the calipers here till they're just touching. And you can see it does thin out as I get towards the, the rim here, which is fine. And if I pull it out, I, I can see them three eighths of an inch or so, a little thinner necessarily than I, I'd shoot for around a half an inch, but that's just an approximate range. So three eighths will be plenty, plenty good there. So now I will continue on, on to the next cavity, further in. Basically the first cavity looked like a inch and a half Forstner bit, went in there and removed all of that, about half the depth. and. Now we're gonna go the rest of the depth and about the same diameter, so inch and a half or so. And I'll be able to tell when I get to the bottom because I've drilled the hole to the bottom. I often get asked why not do this with a Forstner bit? And the simple answer is, is that most people, if you try to do this with a Forstner bit, will then tell you what a bad idea that is. 
Forstner bits are not efficient at removing material. You'll get a lot of burning, squeaking, very slow and time consuming. But the hollowing tool is much more efficient. the tool, I drag it along, there's a little bumps, but roughly a, a curve, no giant steps or bumps along the way from the center, coming out. So a little bit, a little bit more to go in depth, but pretty Pretty close, a little thick towards towards the top. Let's see, it's just touching there. It comes out. I see this this gap, so you know, a quarter of an inch or so difference from here to there. Can't fit my finger all the way, but what I can feel on my fingers, pretty decent. A little bumpy. So to, to smooth up the inside, this, this small cutter that I'm doing most of the hollowing with, a narrow tip is very aggressive, but it tends to leave those little ridges. By switching to a broader tip, now this one happens to, to bolt on, but it's more broad curve, still on a straight shaft, and I have one on a bent shaft as well, um, that will help me smooth up the inside, and just make it a little bit neater. Feel up and down for the center. And I can get over to about the equator. with a light and just look for ridges and looks pretty smooth through there but the only part that I can feel I can't reach with the straight tool so I've got a curved tool has that same broad cutter pull the tool rest back so that I can work right at the rim still be on the straight shaft of the tool and then work inside And drag it along the equator there and then back towards towards the opening You can also get a good sense for how it's hollowed based on the, the feel. Obviously, it's going to be a little bit heavier with this on this end, but you can get a little better feel. Feels decent, relatively consistent. If I put a pencil into the base and 
can eyeball the, the depth there. It's gonna give me a half inch or so of thickness at the top when it's all finished. I, I can still see my finished um, end will be right here at this line. So for now, with it being green, I'll set this aside to dry. It's gonna dry fairly quickly. Uh, most of this is exposed in grain and it's fairly thin, um, you know, a half an inch or, or less in most places. So it's gonna dry pretty quickly. Still have a little bit of sealer on this end initially from when I, when I cut the log. I'll just leave that on there, but um, don't expect to, to do anything different with the rest of this while it dries. And once it is dry, then I can come back, put it back on and fit the base, true it up so that it's, it's running nice and true, perfectly spherical again, and, uh, and the base fits nicely and everything. I let it dry and it's distorted slightly. As the wood dries, it, it tends to move a little bit, and that perfect sphere is now a little bit elongated. It, it's not horrible, but I'd like it to be as perfect as possible. So I'm actually going to return the sphere now with this being a dry piece. The first thing I want to do is I want to note where the center line is. I'm actually going to remove that in the turning process here, but I'd like to know where that original center line was. So I'm just going to take a Sharpie, make a mark. I'll make it further down on my tool rest as well in case my tool wears away there. But that just lines up with the center line there. And that way, once I've removed it, I can put it back on there on a true round surface. As I turn it on, there's just a little bit of vibration to it. So I'll start with a spindle roughing gouge and just true this up just to make it round right here at the center. That's good. Now I can use that mark on my tool rest to reestablish the center line on the sphere. Now I'll start with my small ring and make the small ring fit. At the moment, obviously it does not. I have flattened this area. So I'll need to work this area and I'll use the small ring until I can fit the larger ring. It's much easier to see in the larger ring. So I'll use this as much as possible. I'll just work down one side and then down the other. As I shape here, I tend to work off to a point. That way I ensure that I'm not squashing the sphere, I'm not shortening it too much as I go. If it's hard to hold on to the ring, I can stop the lathe, hold on to it and check. A lot of times though, I can simply leave the lathe running Actually got a really good fit just to the right of the pencil line, just the width of the ring. So I'll make a mental note of where I need to start shaping. Lay the spindle detail gouge on the back of the bevel, raise the handle, and try to begin cutting right where the shape changed. Looking pretty good. The 
string just fits on here. Slide it over any. And I can tell that's it's right where the line is, so it's, it's just exactly the width of the ring is what's spherical. So I have right down here at the bottom. I'll start removing this neck here. That's really a very good fit. That looks really good. Now I can work on preparing the opening. So I want to create a recess in the bottom that's about two inches in diameter. So I'm going to use a pair of calipers just to help mark that. And I'll measure that to be sure, but that gives me a reference line to go to. Just using a square nose scraper here. I really like the carbide scrapers for this because they do have a really sharp, crisp corner. And at the moment, I'm, I'm only cutting by pushing towards the headstock. Occasionally, I like to cut by pushing the tool out from center. And so I like having the cutting edge on both corners. So first I'm just cleaning up the opening, making it nice and smooth. The diameter isn't real critical, roughly an inch and three quarters, but that diameter is not critical. Now I can work on the recess. I'll go in about 3 16 of an inch for depth. Just a little bit deeper. Now I can stop and check. I need this recess to be at least two inches because I have to expand my chuck jaws into here and the minimum that my chuck jaws will expand into is two inches so it has to be at least two inches if I go over that's okay Maybe just a tiny bit deeper. Just a shade over two inches. That'll work perfect. Now I can sand this. So now that I've got it sanded, I'm ready to flip it around. I'm going to expand into it in this recess with my chuck. So I'm going to take it out of here, switch my jaws. I actually have a different chuck. 
just lightly get it positioned. I'll bring the tailstock up, use my original center point there to help support this end. I'll expand the jaws. I'm not going to expand them really tight. For the most part, I'm actually turning this between centers. Um, if I expand the jaws too much, I could actually crack this along the grain. So just enough to hold it there, and the only purpose of the jaws holding them by themselves will be for sanding. So with the tail stock in here, it is held between centers, and I don't have to worry about that chuck being super tight like I normally would. Just my tool rest there. Now I'll start removing some of this waste here and finish shaping the top side. I can pare this down so it's really, really small. Just about an eighth of an inch away is where I'll actually cut it. Tailstock actually stops rotating. Pressure comes off. Can back that up, break off. Break off that little nub. It is pretty secure. I can simply sand from there. I can take a, I can actually stop the lathe. If you're comfortable, you can turn the lathe on and, and do just a little bit of turning here. But you can also just rotate the lathe by hand here, carve a little bit of this away, and then finish the rest up with sandpaper. So now with just that little nub on there, I can turn the lathe on and sand the top smooth, and I can continue to use the ring right across that little nub there. So now to make the cap for the bottom, I've got the piece that I cut off originally from the base. I'm gonna mount that with the tenon that I turned on there in the chuck. Now it's certainly not necessary this will be completely hidden inside the piece once it's sealed up, but just to clean up the bottom, make it look really pretty, I like to take the skew and just make a finishing cut across. It's a little tapered. And that just looks a lot cleaner, good and flat. So the first thing I need to do is create a tenon that will fit into the recess that I made earlier. Doesn't have to be very long. So I've got my calipers marked just over two inches. That's the size of the recess that I made previously.
So there they just fit. Pressed them real tight up against the side, so it should still be just a tiny bit large. It's a very snug fit there. I think I'll probably leave that. That's a good fit. Now I need to reduce the diameter. About two and a half inches is what I'm going for. Just going to switch to a larger parting tool, a little wider. That looks good. Make that a little bit wider. And I could certainly use that surface there and sand it, but a nice light cut with a skew. Can really clean that up. That looks good. <clears throat> Now I need to actually undercut so that when this goes onto the sphere, it makes a crisp joint between this two and a half inch diameter and the sphere. So to do that, I just need a pointed scraper and my skew has a nice point on it. So I'm going to position the cutting edge of the skew parallel to that tenon that I created. And then push in towards the headstock, so I'm pushing at an angle to my left and in towards the center. And I'm just undercutting to create a spot for that sphere to end right where it meets the tenon. And if I stop, I had a good diameter there on the tenon, so if I stop right as I get to that diameter, that should leave real nice. That's a good tight fit. That's what I'm looking for. Now I can take this out and I'll actually grab on to this tenon with the chuck. My tenon that was left is just a little short. I don't like relying solely on that to support it. So while I can do most of my turning with the tailstock in place, pull it out of the way. So I'll use a roughing gouge, remove most of this extra. The base is actually only gonna be an half an inch long. So I'll mark that length now. So I'll just switch the lathe on Mark that length. Take a parting tool and I'll part down. Normally I would part all the way through this, but 
just the length of the tenon that I had on this piece. I'd really like to leave the tail stock in place for most of it. So I'll just leave a small section at the bottom. Rough and gouge makes quick work of reducing the rest. And once again, I could use the parting tool, but the skew leaves just a little nicer finish, so I'll go right on my line, make a couple of cuts right up to it. My finished cut right on the line for the bottom. Finished piece, this will be covered up, so it doesn't have to be perfect. But it is a good spot to practice this cut. And I'll check it with a straight edge. It does need to be flat or slightly concave. That one's just a little bit convex. So I'll need to make another pass. And that's just a little bit concave, which is fine. Yep, perfect. Now I'll mark a few other lines. A sixteenth of an inch. I want just a little tenon to go into the base that I drilled with a Forstner bit. And then three sixteenths to leave straight. In between those two lines will be half of a cove. So I need to part down on that right hand line to a two inch diameter that fits into this recess that I drilled with a Forstner bit into the base. So again, I'll adjust my calipers. So now I'm going to part a very small tenon. It's only a sixteenth of an inch wide. Till it fits my calipers here. So those fit. I'll double check. Uh, when I get to the end, I'll, I'll remove this and I'll double check that it, it does fit inside there. But now I'm going to turn a cove in between, half of a cove, in between this pencil line and that tenon.
Now I've gotten that shaping done. I'll go ahead and remove this waste. And I'll actually use the tip of the skew just to separate the two. And finish the bottom. Check that that fits. Perfect, nice snug fit there. So I'll just sand this up and I'm gonna drill a small hole in the center for a screw.